management pre sales and practice development uh, along with the pre sales and practice development work with the team to uh, to win multiple <coughs> multi million dollar project.
Yes. Uh, good morning, students. Good morning to you all. We have the first Mary Kudi. We have it as well. Yes, Judy. Uh, good morning, students. Good morning to you all. We have the first Mary Kudi.
respected speaker professor tushar kanti bera assistant professor of electrical engineering department at nit durgapur professor devanshu de respected speaker professor tushar kanti bera assistant professor, professor department of electrical engineering at assistant Yadapur professor University. of electrical engineering department Points and my dear students at nit durgapur Today we all have gathered in a webinar as respected speaker of the Professor Kanti Bera, Department of Electric Recent Engineering, and Advanced Computer Science and Electric Engineering and Information Imaging, and my dear students. At NIT, I am Dugapu. highly honored today to take this opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of the Professor Kanti Bera, Department, Department, Department of Electric Research and Advanced Computer Science and Electric Engineering, and Information Imaging, and my dear students. At NIT, I am highly honored today to take this opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of the Professor Kanti Bera, Department of Electric Research and Advanced Computer Science and Electric Engineering, and Information Imaging, and my dear students. At NIT, I am highly honored today to take this opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of the Professor Kanti Bera, Department of Electric Research and Advanced Computer Science and Electric Engineering, and Information Imaging, and my dear students. At NIT, I am highly honored today to and imaging are technologies by which biomedical information is acquired and process which are of great significance for the early detection rapid diagnosis and precise treatment of disease biomedical sensing and imaging involve multiple disciplines including electronic information technology biomedical technology artificial intelligence and more during past years considerable research efforts have been devoted to biomedical sensing and imaging common biomedical sensing technologies such as ecg eeg and ivus have been successfully applied in clinical medicine more recent wearable smart biosensors and devices which facilitate and diagnosis in a non clinical settings have become hot topic i am sure that we all will feel enriched with knowledge and completion of this webinar i welcome you all once again to the webinar and hope that you all will have a great time ahead thank you all shnashish thank you sir for uh, such a nice introductory speech now without uh, wasting the time let me introduce this honorable speaker with us we are very fortunate that dr tushar kanti bera at nasus edit nit durgapur has kind enough to be in this webinar dr bera has done his bachelor in from jalpaiguri government engineering college masters from calcutta university has done phd from iit bangalore and we have done several doctoral research in south korea saudi arabia india arizona and so on 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 Apart from these full-time postdoctoral research works, Dr. Bera has also worked as the visiting scientist in the University of Stuttgart, Germany, in Germany. Germany. as the research collaborator with the Kyunghee University, South Korea, and the University of Bath, UK. In 2012 to 2013, Dr. Bera has also worked as the scientific consultant with AAEP, Saudi Arabia, 2013-2014, and Movecom. 2013 to 2020 as a faculty member in india dr bera worked as an assistant professor department of electrical engineering at holdia institute of technology holdia west bengal india from 2003 to 2005 and an associate professor department of medical electronics at bms college of engineering holdia west bengal 2014 to 2015 he has also worked as a visiting lecturer as the college of paramedical science hold the art west bengal india 2003 to 2004 dr bera has also worked as a visiting assistant professor at yonsei university south korea in 2013 to 2014 at present dr bera is working as an assistant professor in the department of electrical engineering national institute of technology durgapur he is also working as the associate faculty member at the center for biomedical engineering and assistive technology beat and center for advanced research in energy scare in nit durgapur the research interests of dr bera includes electrical and electronic measurement and instrumentation electrical impedance and ultrasound based non uh, non invasive tissue characterizations and health monitoring techniques biomedical instrumentation and medical imaging during his 
post research tenure, he has majorly worked on the design and development of instrumentation, sensing, signal processing, data acquisition, and image reconstruction for electrical, electronic, biometric, aerospace, and material engineering applications. Dr. Bera has obtained a number of research publications, including five book chapters, 37 peer reviewed journal papers, 39 conference papers, three theses, and a number of abstracts and technical reports. In his academic career, Dr. Vera yeah, has won 25 academic awards, achievements, and honors. He has also been selected for the DST Fast Track Young Scientist Project Award from the Government of India. He is working as the editorial board members and the reviewers of several international journals. At present, Dr. Vera is a fellow of Institute of Engineers, IEI India. He is also the lifetime member of Instrument Society of India, ISOI. Indian Society for Technical Education, ISTE, Association of Medical Physicists of India, AMPI. He is also a member of several technical societies and organizations. Dr. Vera has delivered a number of invited talks and in, at universities and institutes in India and abroad, including IISC Bangalore, IIT Kharagpur, CPRI Bangalore, NIT's IIESD Shippur, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala University of Stuttgart, Germany, Kyung He University, KAUST Saudi Arabia, University of Colorado, USA, etc. Basically, a man having such an enriched CV, even a whole day is not enough to uh, describe his achievements. So this was very formal and brief introduction of him. Without further wasting time, let me introduce you the speaker to deliver his speech. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for nice introduction and thank you all the dignitaries and professors and uh, my dear students present here, respected, respected principal, vice principal, head of the department, Professor Thiuri, Professor Goshal, uh, Professor Chaudhuri. So it is my pleasure today to be a part of the BCL Engineering College and yeah, so BC Engineering College is very closer to NIT Durgapur. It is not only closer in distance, but closer in relation. So we are very, very happy to collaborate in many ways with Dr. BC Engineering College. And that's why it is my pleasure today to present my talk on electrical impedance tomography. So I'm requesting you to give your kind permission to share my laptop or desktop so that I can show my presentation slides. So can yeah. you get the permission? Sir, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you very much. Is the screen visible? Yes, it's visible. <clears throat> Good morning, all. Today. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Very, very good morning. So today we will discuss about electrical impedance tomography for biomedical imaging. We will discuss the research trends, challenges and possibilities. So electrical impedance tomography is one kind of imaging technique which is used for the medical diagnosis, for biomedical engineering, and for many other applications. But in most of the cases, we will see that this technology is either little bit known or it may be completely unknown to many of the participants today. So to give one basic idea about electrical impedance tomography and why it is required, why other techniques are not discussed today? So why we are here to discuss about electrical impedance tomography? So 
So definitely this technique will have some advantages for which the researcher, scientist, faculties all are interested in this field. And let us see that what type of purpose can be solved, what type of practical problems can be solved. And we will also discuss whether it is possible to contribute in, in the fight of uh, today's life against the COVID pandemic. So whether the EIT can contribute anything or not. So we will also look into that. So before going into the application part, we will discuss in detail the instruments and that how as engineer, we can develop some EIT system so that we can use it to solve our practical problems. So in the slide, whatever is visible here now, is showing one human body with several tissues, several organs. And also in the right side, we are seeing that one human body is lying on the bed and probably he has some problem, health problem. And some clinicians and doctors are looking after him and they are taking care. They are using some instrument and they are seeing some signals here. So yes, the signal is very important. The signal from our body, whatever is coming or whatever is acquired by some instruments, by some machines, those signals are very important because those signals are enriched of the physiological information, anatomical information. So yes, the instrument, whatever is shown here in this slide is nothing but electrical impedance tomograph. So there are many instruments whenever during some of our unfortunate time, if we have to visit to the clinics or hospitals, we generally come across several types of clinical instruments. Some instruments have some screen showing some signals, ups, uh, ups and downs, some signals, features are there, which are very important to note for the clinicians and the doctors. And they are continuously trying to give the best service to give the quick recovery for any patient. So those instruments are very, very important. Those are called medical instruments or biomedical instruments. And why the instruments are used? To acquire the signals from the body so that we can get some information. Whenever we are going to the doctor, they are checking our body with stethoscope. Yes, that stethoscope is also giving some signals. That is sound wave. And that sound mm -hmm. wave is coming from the heart. It is creating some sounds and that sound will change if our health condition changes, especially if it is related to heart. But in most of the cases, many diseases have direct relation to the heart sound, the health of heart. So whenever we are going to the doctor for some disease or illness, doctors are diagnosing us. They are checking up with some instruments. First of all, they will measure the temperature, BP, heart sound, all our signals. Whatever is measured by thermometer, that is temperature signal. Whatever is measured by stethoscope, that is sound signal. And whatever is measured by the sphygma manometer, a carb-based blood pressure monitor, that is measuring the pressure signal. So yes, we are here today in the right platform. The recent advances in signal processing and systems so that we can see whatever is going on inside our human body. So today we will see what type of contribution may come from the electrical impedance tomography so that we can get some knowledge apart from our regular classes or apart from our regular subjects. If we want to know something new, definitely we have to jump into the research field. So I will discuss a little bit about my experience, whatever I have learned during my PhD and postdoctoral research, but I will definitely try my level best to present in such a way so that it is understandable to the students, faculties who are new to this field. So recent advances in biomedical sensing and imaging will give us one mutual uh, discussion forum so that we can ask some doubts. So you all are invited to ask any questions 
even in between my presentation, whenever you have any doubt in your mind. So I will not mind to answer in between. And again, after the talk, definitely I will discuss to answer your doubts if anything is there in your mind. So let us start. So first of all, we will think about the human body. Human body is a complex biological subject, living subject, which has a huge number of cells, organs, and the body systems. So the body systems will work with the coordination of some organs. Organs, as for example, we can start from the central processing unit of our body, that is CPU of our biological body. So this is a biological CPU, brain. After that, we will get other major organs like heart, lungs, kidneys, ears, and eyes. And all these organs are collaborating. They're doing their work, not independently. All organs are interrelated through biological relation. So if a one organ is damaged or defected or suffering from some disease, the other systems and other organs will be affected. And we need to diagnose the problem as soon as possible so that we can give the treatment to, to make the patient recovered from that illness or disease. So we will come across the muscular system, skeletal system, the mechanical system of the body so that we can get the strength. We can stand straight. We can bend to pick up a pain, fall on the ground. Even we can run to win a race. And throughout the life, there will be one system which will be mechanically pumping the liquid or pumping the body fluid called blood. So yes, that is restless pump, that is heart. And so the heart has the responsibility to pump the blood so that blood can reach to all the corners of the cells and tissues in the body. After that, there will be the sensing part or the sensors. So there will be the nervous system. So sensor systems will be developed with the skin and other extremities so that we can sense something, temperature, heat, pressure, and all things. So that signal will be going to the central processing unit so that the, the CPU can generate some signal or information to give it to the actuators of our body, that is muscle, so that it can act accordingly. So if somebody is raising the hand to you for shaking the hand, we are also raising our hand to accept. Why it is there? Because our eyes are accepting the signals, visual signals. So we are getting the signals that yes, the person who is standing in front of us, they are, they are willing to greet us. So definitely we will be honored. We will raise our hand also. So how it is happening? Because we will see through eyes, that signal will go to the brain, brain will be happy and they will, it will generate its signal. It will tell that signal, it will send the signal through the nervous system, it will reach to the muscle and we will also raise our hand and then we'll be happy to greet each other. Now, whenever there is a system, definitely there will be some monster. So in our atmosphere, many monsters are roaming here and there, airborne bacteria viruses all around are there. So if we are breathing the air, it is entering to our body, sometimes mixing with the blood, and then again, some something are thrown out, something that's not possible immediately. So some extruders get, uh, say, reach into the blood or tissue. So definitely there will be one soldier system or military system. So security system must be there for any, any institute like that in our body also, we'll have the security system that is called lymphatic system or immune system. So whenever there will be some unwanted cells or some extruders coming outside, so, so there will be some uh, uh, particles or there will be some uh, say pathogens or there will be some virus bacteria, those will, those will enter to the body and all these things will be uh, fighting, that immune system will fight against these uh, unwanted particles. Okay, so this is the uh, animation of the heart pumping throughout the life. And then the circulatory system will have some other components also, arteries and veins. And lung will be there. Why the lungs is there? Lungs are there to purify the blood because whenever we need some energy, because for keeping our body healthy and alive, we need some energy. And that energy is generated from the food. And food 
whenever it is reaching to the cell, we need the oxygen to burn the fuel to get the energy. So for burning something, we need the oxygen and that oxygen is taken through the nostrils because oxygen is available in our uh, atmospheric air that will be entering to the body. It will go to the lung because the nostrils are connected to the lungs and lungs will have the alveoli and that will be extracting oxygen from there and it will be mixed with the blood. And also whenever the energy will be generated as an end product, carbon dioxide will be also generated and that carbon dioxide will not be good if it stays in the blood. So that is called impure blood, wherever the carbon dioxide is there. So that should be thrown out from the body. So that extraction, extraction of carbon dioxide from the blood is done by the lungs also. So oxygen is mixed with and carbon dioxide is extracted from the blood. So these are the complex system of the veins and arteries. Red colors are generally conventionally used for representing the arteries, that is oxygen mixed blood and blue color is representing the carbon dioxide mixed blood, that is veins. Now, how the heart beats, these are the very basics from the sine arterial node to AV node and then the Parkinji fiber and the bundle of S. So we will get the electrical signal. Those electrical signals are called the electrocardiogram. And the machine which can acquire that signals, that is called electrocardiograph. And the procedure of measuring that electrical signal generated by the heart is called electrocardiography. So here by this animation, you can see that say oxygen mixed blood, that is oxygen is mixed with the blood. Carbon dioxide mixed blood is entering to the lung and it is getting a read of carbon dioxide and it is getting mixed off with the oxygen. So oxygen mixed blood is again coming to the heart so that heart can pump it out to send it to the body parts. And body parts will take that oxygen to generate energy. Carbon dioxide will be generated that will also reach to the heart and that heart will pump it out so that it can reach to the pulmonary system or the lungs so that it can be purified again. So this is the animation, real animation, how the heart is complexly made. The muscles are triggered to be pumped so that the heart can pump the blood and there are several valves to control the which blood will go to which part of the body. That is carbon dioxide mixed blood and oxygen mixed blood must not be mixed inside the heart. Otherwise we will have some disease or health problem. Okay, so this is the animation of pumping of blood. Now we will come to the disease. Now we understood, we got some basic idea about the human system, though there are a lot of things to be uh, say uh, known, but due to the time constraint, we will uh, confine with that much of anatomy only. So now we will go to the disease, how disease comes. So definitely it may come from the pathogens, virus, bacteria, so fungi, protozoa, many things will be there. And some uh, diseases may come also after some uh, environmental effect, some society, social effect, many things are there, but the infection is created sometimes by the outside particles or pathogens. So there are many types of diseases and some diseases are also found to occur inside the body due to the lack of food or lack of vitamins or lack of minerals. So these are the uh, components of the food. So we can cook or we can eat or we can consume something sometimes raw, which are enriched of some nutrients and vitamins and minerals. Now, if we are eating so much uh, unhealthy food, sometimes we may have so many diseases. First of all, the first thing will come in the stomach pain or diarrhea, something dysentery. And for a long term, and a serious problem may occur whenever you will have some lot of oily foods. So some fatty material may be accumulated inside the blood vessel. So that <clears throat> fatty deposit will block the region of the blood vessel so that heart will pump, but blood will not reach to the body extremities with a particular amount which is required for healthy life. So that's at that time heart will realize that blood is not getting pumped very freely. So it will try to pressure it more so that our heart will be exhausted. So those many type of heart disease may occur either the with the plaque or sometimes 
the exhaustness of the heart. So there will be several other uh, irregular beating of the heart due to several problems that is called say arrhythmia. And also there will be several diseases like lung disease. So lungs are developed with alveoli, small, small sac of air. Here you can see that. And this, the blood vessels will be surrounding the circular balls of air, so the alveoli. The alveoli will get the oxygen from the air through the nostril and it will give that oxygen to the blood vessels. And this red, red blood vessels are taking that oxygen mixed blood and sending it to the heart. And this blue color blood vessels, they are connected with the veins of the body and they are getting the blood through the heart and which is oxygen with less blood or carbon dioxide mixed blood. Here you can see that whenever you are inhaling, the, the alveoli are getting say, inflated. And that time the, the gas transfer is happening. Now, if there is any disease like pneumonia or COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So chronic means it is severe, obstructive means it is giving some obstruction, pulmonary means related to the lung and disease. So here you can see that the alveoli are infected or sometimes the air pathways will be in, in, inflammable and that's why there will be less area of the air so that we can feel some breathing problem kind of asthma or something else. So there are also other organs like kidneys which are also purifying the blood and the most dangerous and uh, say life-threatening disease is cancer. So we have heard that word in, 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 in our social life many times and we are all afraid and how that type of uh, disease is coming due to several effects, due to several uh, effect means there will be some genetic problem, there may be some heredity and also there will be some uh, wrong food. If the foods are eaten from the hot plastics, so research has shown that, then the, some materials are created or extracted from the plastic material at high temperature, which will create the cancer cells or which will create the tumor. So we should avoid those things. We should avoid smoking and we should avoid so many bad foods which are uh, creating some cancer cells or which has some tendency to create. So whenever the cancer cell will be produced, why those cells are called cancerous? Those cells are uncontrolled group of cells. Means whenever cells are developed in our body, those cells are uh, having some certain uh, duration of life. After that, those cells will be dying and again, new cells will be taking place of the old cells. So that type of circulation of cyclic order of cells are happening in our body so that our body will get after some periodic time, we will get some new cells in the place of old cells. But sometimes that growth of the cell is not controllable. It is growing very fast. So it is not obeying the signal coming from the brain or the or, or rest of the body. So that's why that type of cells are making a group and they are becoming a lump and that lump is called tumor. And why <clears throat> the lymphatic system or immune system cannot recognize that type of cells? Because in most of the cases, the cell membrane is similar to our body normal cells. So the immune system detects the abnormal things from the structure of the cell membrane. So if the structure of the cell membrane of the tumor cells are also same with the normal body cells, so definitely it will not be possible to understand. So it is understand that what type of uh, cells are there, it is dangerous for body or it is normal cells. So immune system fails to kill it at the initial stage. That's why in most of the cases, cancerous cells or tumors are found after a certain stage whenever it, it has already grown. So doctors are trying their level best, even scientists are also doing research in this field, how to detect the cancers at the initial stage. Because if it is detected at the initial stage, many therapies are there so we can treat the patient. So that's why there will be several stages like here you can see that T1 stage, T2 stage, T3 stage, and T4 stage. It is growing day by day and we can uh, get that it is almost covering the normal body organ so that uh, it will be painful. And whenever there will be some pain 
or some abnormalities which is visible from the outside then we can see that oh that there, there is some tumor kind of so otherwise before that it is very difficult for understanding for the person that who uh, who are having unfortunately that type of disease so now the another uh, say dangerous uh, disease is stroke so we will see that some blood vessels can rupture or some plaque may be formed and if the plaque is formed then some blood vessels will be narrower and automatically blood cannot flow and there will be some obstacle so if there is some very tiny arteries or veins and if the blood clot is coming it can block and whenever it will be block blocking the uh, blood vessels so automatically some resin will be shedded and there will be no blood and it will be having some disease that is called stroke so we can you say see that the patient can fall and he or she can be faint so we can see that blood vessels are getting narrower due to the plaque and all the red blood cells or other blood cells are getting obstacle there so it is not getting the normal say passage to pass through it and this is the one animation where we can see that the abnormal cells are growing fast to make a tumor and that can flow from one part of the other part so that's why it is sometimes called that cancer has spread it from one part to the other part of the body so we have also uh, say experienced with some diseases now so we understood what is the anatomy physiology what are the body systems how body works and what type of complexities are there what type of diseases may come major diseases are discussed so now we are uh, at the proper stage to discuss about the treatment procedures so health and disease diagnostics so whenever we are feeling some abnormality in our body or we are not feeling well so we, we call it some illness or say symptoms so we are going we are not able to understand what is happening because we are not trained with the medicine so who are trained with the medicine and who are knowledgeable in the clinical diagnostics who are called clinicians or doctors we are visiting them so in the ancient time when the instruments were not there so doctors are also little bit helpless they are also trying to understand what is happening but they are observing uh, signals that is uh, visual observation touch sensing or hearing those who are not sufficient to understand in many cases so we lost many lives after that we got our science so biology chemistry physics mathematics so many things have come so in the biology we studied the say anatomy of uh, human body and many things in medicine we understood the what type of disease may come during disease and before disease what type of anatomical structures are there what type of pathology is there so many things are taught in the medicine and whenever the biology and medicine are studied then we know the health and disease but how to treat that whenever we have to um, treat something we need to diagnose first and for diagnosing we need some instruments so in engineering uh, we have several instrument by which you can see the signals like say sinusoidal signals if you want to see a signal uh, we need some oscilloscope if we want to generate some signal we need function generator so many things can be done with the electricity so definitely there will be some instruments which will be useful for detecting some signals also because our body has some signals which either in electrical signal like ecg and eeg or we can convert those signals into the electrical signals like that electronic say uh, blood pressure monitor so pressure signals are converted into the electrical signals so that you can visualize it nowadays in the modern instruments so first of all whenever the biology and medicine and engineering collaborates we found the biomedical engineering field and in the biomedical engineering field we got several engineers and scientists who are working with the instruments and those instruments are called biomedical instruments so first of all whenever we will are discussing with the the domain biomedical engineering we must have both the things that is diagnosis and treatment so for the diagnosis we can uh, see that we are acquiring some signals we are either by visual observation or listening the sound or measuring some blood pressure parameters or sometimes we are touching our body parts and we are feeling it by our skin and doctors are experts to understand what is happening if they are not they are, they are sometimes prescribing some other test whenever the tests are done result have come the doctor will prescribe some medicines if the medicine does not 
uh, say effective, found effective, then they go for surgery. So these are the procedure for diagnosis and treatment, what is happening in the hospitals. So, so you will see that many domains are nowadays is collaborating with the biomedical engineering field so that we can get the modern healthcare. And that's why we got several instruments which are used for detecting some body signals. So which can be utilized for measuring the signals coming from the body. As for example, from thermometer, blood pressure monitors, but most, most of the instruments are sometimes invasive or sometimes non-invasive. Non-invasive non instruments are very useful because it is not disturbing our health or it is not uh, say giving some uh, medicine inside the body for detecting something else. So invasive means it is inserting some object inside the body. That's why it is called invasive. Minimally invasive means it is inserting to the body cavity like nostrils, ears, mouth, which are created by nature. Non-invasive means we are putting the sensors or electrodes on the surface of the body and non-contact means nothing is put on the body. It, all the signals are collecting from the outside away from the surface of the skin. Signal type may be temperature, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, blood count, etc. And there are some other instruments which are taking the image. That taking the image means it will also collect some image from the uh, so body parts. It may be a X-ray imaging. X-ray imaging is called X-ray simply, but X-ray stands for the electromagnetic radiation. And that is nothing but the ray. The procedure what is conducted by the domain, say X-ray imaging, that is called X-ray planar radiography, which is nothing but the light shadowing experiment what we did in our childhood or schooling. So we put a light and then we put a ball and up the, at the last stage we put one screen or on the simple wall we got the shadow. Similarly, we put the object to be imaged at the middle and at the both side, starting side and ending side, there will be source and detector. So the X-ray was invented by Rontgen and after that it was found very useful for detecting many type of diseases, abnormalities in the anatomy. So it is exoplanar radiography machine where patient will stand. This is the X-ray source. At the opposite side, there will be X-ray screen. But after some time, people realize that if we want to see the cross section of the body, the X-ray planar radiography fails. And that's why the X-ray CT, MRI or PET or SPECT came. After that, ultrasound and the endoscopy, fluoroscopy, many imaging devices came. So now we will see that whether the electrical impedance tomography can work in this way or not. Let's see. So whenever we will have some image, if the image is the planar projection, then it will give some information. But if we want to see the cross section of the body, then we should go for the tomography that is called CT, computed tomography. So whenever we are hearing that some doctor has prescribed for CT, that is nothing but the X-ray CT. And X-ray CT is in short form, in usual language we are calling it CT. But CT is one technical uh, word that is computer tomography and that may be associated with x-ray that may be associated with magnetic field that may be associated with electrical current so whenever the ct is conducted with electrical current that is called electrical impedance tomography so first of all uh, rontgen uh, is uh, the has conducted the ground backing research so he invented the x-ray x-ray is electromagnetic radiation ionizing radiation why it is called ionizing radiation because it has energy sufficient energy to make the cells into the iron. So it can destroy sometimes cells. That's why X-ray is not very say, uh, safe for the human body, but with some limited dose, we can use that because it has a lot of power. So it has a lot of potential to get the good image of the human body. That's why it is being used for many diagnostic purposes. But whenever we are seeing that extraplanar radiography is sending X-ray and that is projecting the X-ray from one position, and that is done for a fraction of a second. And after that, we will get that type of pictures. But if it is conducted for the skull, then it will fail because we are not able to visualize the inside the skull because there are several layers of the tissue and all will be superimposed. And most of all, the skull will not be penetrated in image. So that's why we are not getting the integrated picture. And that's why it was invented. Uh, the, it, the city was invented by the researchers because tomography imaging will give the cross-sectional representation of the tissue. So that is non-invasive and also non-destructive. So Alan Carmack and uh, Hounsfield invented that uh, city using the X-ray and that's why they got the Nobel Prize in Physics and Medicine. So in the X-ray city, there will be a one X-ray source which will rotate and which will project for several times. In the planar radiography, 
what we saw here, only one time projection was there. It was not rotating, but in case of city, we are seeing that it is rotating and we are getting so many sets of data which are collected by the yellow color boxes, which are nothing but the X-ray detectors. Now, this is the construction of the machine. There are uh, the detectors which are arranged in the periphery and we are sending the X-ray and we are getting the cross-section of the body with the help of the reconstruction algorithm, which can be written in the computer program. So this is the CT machine and that CT machine will have very complex structure. And we will see that the person can lie on the table and one X-ray so the movie is not running, I guess. I'm very sorry for that. So this is the X-ray source. It is sending, sending X-ray and we're getting the X-ray passing through the body at different angles. And the detectors are collecting the data and that is sent to the computer. And computer will have the image reconstruction algorithm. So this type of images will be visible. This is for abdominal image and this is for chest image. This is for brain image. And doctors are uh, say well experienced with that type of images so that they can identify which tissues are normal tissues and which are some plaque or some tumorous tissue is already formed. So if there is any tumor in the lung, so definitely there may be some somewhere there may be extra tissue and which will be visible. And with the help of some contrast also, the image contrast can be enhanced. But in case of magnetic resonance imaging, that is MRI, we use the magnetic field, which is huge in amount and that magnetic field is produced by superconducting magnet and that's why the instrument is very costly and also as it's use a lot of energy so image resolution is very good and we are getting one medical imaging device which is not using the x-ray so that's why it is safe but there will be some other problems because whenever we are lying inside the magnetic field so definitely if the patient has any body implants like metals or some steel implants in the leg or there will be some pacemakers inside the body. So those patients are not at all safe for going into the MMRI machine. So there are a lot of problem will be there and uh, it will be sometimes life threatening. So these are the limitations because before going into the uh, MRI room, we should remove all the metal objects which are there. Like say we will have some rings, bangles, necklace sometimes. There will be some key rings also in the pocket. So mobile phones, all everything should be so very properly checked and all these things will not be taken inside the MRI machine's room. Okay, so and there are some nuclear medicines by which we will inject some long live radioactive materials and they will emit the gamma rays and those will be collected by gamma camera either in one direction or two direction or in multiple directions so that we can get the computed tomography of the emitted gamma rays. So this is the structure of gamma camera. Single photon emission computed tomography that is called SPECT or there will be some other imaging technique position emission tomography that is called PECT. So for the time constant I'm just skipping those things because these are, uh, are time consuming. So this type of images are constructed with the help of gamma rays. And this is the construction of one position emission tomography. There will be angiography, fluoroscopy, and mammography. Those are also the X-ray based imaging techniques. And there will be some ultrasounds. 
So ultrasounds will generate some sounds which are not audible and that will be sent to the body and the reflected ultrasound will be collected and it will be processed in the computer to get the images. And there will be also microscopy in the pathological lab. Sometimes there will be biological cells under the transmission electron microscopy or in the, you know, the scanning electron microscope so that you can get the more uh, good images. But in, in vivo imaging with the help of microbiological microscope and uh, SEM or TEM is not uh, very suitable for that. These are the comparison of the imaging. So first row is showing the X-ray radiography after the CT scanning, MRI and PET scanning. So PET scanning is very fruitful for uh, visualizing the cancer cells. Now we will discuss about the impedance-based health monitoring. So impedance-based health monitoring, how is it possible to get that imaging techniques? So electricity is one kind of energy, which is very easily transferable. That's why it is generated in bulk form in one place in the power plant. And it is transmitted and distributed so that we can get the electrical power for our daily appliances. So electricity is one kind of energy whenever the electricity is required to be sent from one place to other place there should be some potential difference and whenever there will be load that load will carry some current it will consume the electrical power so source will send the power and whenever there will be some uh, source and load connected together path will be closed so that means current will be conducted and the current will be conducted from the positive part to the negative part through the load and from negative part to the positive part through the source so these are the conventions and whenever it will be sent through some components, either say registers, capacitors, and inductors, depending on the type of the electricity, the response will be obtained. So the electricity may be either DC or AC. So DC and AC can be understood very well. And these are the very basics that whenever it is changing the polarity, whenever the, the waveforms are cutting the time axis and it is going down, that means it's changing the polarity. That's why it is called alternative. And if the polarity is fixed, whether it is varying in magnitude or not, that is different thing. It is called pulsating DC. So the signal which are not at all changing its polarity is called DC and which are changing the polarity that is which are going down to the time axis is called alternating in nature. Now, whenever the alternating signals are found, that is required to be understood that whether it is called periodic or non-periodic. Periodic means it will be changing its cycles with a regular time, <coughs> sorry. And in case of DC current, as the polarity is not being changed, that means the electricity cause, that is the flow of electrons or flow of holes are, are flowing in a particular direction. That's why it is called DC. And the rate of uh, flow is constant. That's why you are getting the pure DC. But in case of AC, the, the signals which are created by the flow of the particles, those are changing in direction. So that's why it is called alternating. And also the rate of change is also changing. That's why you are getting the variable magnitude. So in, in general, the electricity is generated in the form of sinusoidal form. So we are using all circular machines. So it is rotating with this particular speed, constant speed. So definitely it will be generating some constant frequency signals. And whenever the signal is sinusoidal signal or potential is applied across some components like register, capacitor, inductors, depending on the property of the material, there will be phase change between the current and voltage. So that's why there will be some either capacitive effect or inductive effect. If there is resistive effect, all the signals will be generated at a particular time. It will go reach at the same time. There will be no phase displacement. So these are the basics of the signals of AC and DC. So you will understand that whenever there will be some capacitor, there will be some capacitive reactance, which is uh, denoted by one by omega C, and there will be inductive reactance, which is omega L. So, and the Z will be the cumulative effect of the all the parameters being there. There may be several other formulas for series parallel or parallel series or only parallel. This is shown by the, the slide uh, for one series circuit. Okay, so now the impedance measurement. How the impedance can be measured for a particular material? If we have a brick, we have a stone, we have a sand particle, how to measure the impedance? Whenever you will apply some electrical current, if the current is AC in nature, we, we, we will see that some voltage will be developed and that voltage will be proportional to the current by the Ohm's law. So we can get the resistance of the material if the injected current is DC. If the injected current is AC, you can get the uh, impedance with the same law. So now if we have one unknown object and if you are injecting some electrical current, sinusoidal current, we will get the sinusoidal voltage also. And that voltage will be developed throughout the body. 
and we can measure the voltage across any two material points. So we can get the voltage and utilizing the formula, if the current is represented by I m sin, sin omega t, there will be some voltage which will be represented by B m sin omega t plus minus theta, depending on the material property, whether there is a capacitive effect or inductive effect, the plus minus sign will come. And these are the measurement schematic, four pro method and two pro method. Now we will see that how the impedance can be measured at different, different frequency, because it's a uh, say function of frequency, omega is there. So if you change the frequency, and if we measure the voltage, we will get different type of impedance at different value of impedance. So that is called impedance spectroscopy. And if we have the impedance spectroscopy, we will get different kind of Stisu equivalent circuit. Because if we get the real part and imaginary part along the x-axis and y-axis respectively, then we will get the Stisu characteristics and we can solve it, This analyze this curve with some software and we can get the electrical equivalent circuit of the tissue sample. So that type of tissue sample circuit may come depending on the circular paths which are obtained from the electrical impedance spectroscopy. So if the curves are changing, then we can tell that the other tissue is there or the tissue anatomy is changed or tissue health is changed. So there are several standard data by which we can understand that what type of uh, property is there for the tissue, either tissue is normal in nature or it is a tumor, tumor tissue or it is malignant tissue kind of. So impedance analyzers or LCR meters are used for impedance spectroscopy. It is a electronic instrument and it will have four electrodes. We can attach to the object and we can set the starting frequency, ending frequency, and then we can conduct the electrical impedance spectroscopy, injecting current from frequency one to N and we will get Z1 to Zn, theta1 to theta n. From there, we will be able to get the real part and imaginary part for all the frequency points. And whenever we will plot the real part along the x-axis and y-axis in the imaginary part, so we will get some circular path. This is called Nyquist plot. And analyzing the circular path, we can get the electrical equivalent circuit. So these are the theory that if the inductor and registers are in parallel, those circular paths will start from the zero and it will be at the positive y-axis. If it is capacitive in nature, it will be at the downside. And also if there is any series resistance, the car will start certain point away from the central point. So like that, we can get several types of electrical equivalent circuit for the tissue. So now how the capacitors are coming for from the tissue? Our cells are surrounded by the cell membrane and cell membrane can be cut and we can visualize that they are the protein lipid protein bilayer structure. And proteins that is represented by red color here is the conducting medium and the yellow color fat is nothing but the insulating in medium because oils are all fat. Uh, so automatically the oil is insulated because in transformer we use the transformer oil. So definitely it is, has some insulating in nature. So insulating nature is there inside and the other side, two sides are conducting in nature. Definitely the capacitance will come. So if we have one isolated cell, if we inject current, current will have two paths, either through the extracellular fluid represented by the pink car pink region, or it may also penetrate the cell. Now at the low frequency signal and high frequency signal current path will be changed. Now this is the electrical equivalent circuit of the cell because cell membrane will have capacitance, intercellular fluid have resistance, and extracellular fluid will have resistance. Because those two fluids, the intercellular fluid and extracellular fluids will have ionic medium and water in most of the cases. And that's why they will be having some low resistance path. Now, if we inject the current, these are the plant cell modeling. So we will skip that. Now, if we inject current at the low frequency, we will see that current are trying to bypass the cell membrane because the low frequency means denominator will be very less and this impedance will be very high. If the impedance is very high, current will try to bypass because current, current has tendency to follow the least resistance path. So that's why the low frequency current will pass to the extracellular fluid. If we increase the frequency, then the denominator will be very high and the impedance will be very less and it can be able to penetrate the cells. So current paths will be straightforward. So that can be also studied by the console simulation or any kind of software-based simulation so that we can have some interface that is the cells. And we can see that our low frequency current lines are trying to avoid. And whenever we have increased the current uh, frequency, we are seeing that current paths are uh, able to penetrate the cells. So if we have a cell section, we can get the impedance. And measuring the impedance, several kind of disease diagnostic tools are developed. That is bioelectrical impedance analysis by which we can measure the body fat, body water. Impedance plethysmography by which we can measure the amount of the blood passing through the limb. If we apply the electrodes at the transverse region and measure the impedance, that is called impedance cardiography, by which we can diagnose the health of the heart and hemodynamic systems. 
and this is the impedance spectroscopy, which is not only used for tissue diagnostic, but also for battery circuit analysis, photovoltaic cell analysis, material or thin film diagnostics, and many more. So now we will come to the impedance tomography. As tomography told, till that point, we have measured the impedance at particular frequency point, we got the values only. Sometimes we get the curves, circular curve, or sometimes other type of curve, but all are only curves. There is no tissue picture was found. So now we are going for tomography where special distribution of the electrical conductivity or resistivity within a closed domain is reconstructed from the surface potential developed by the injecting electrical current. What is the meaning of that big sentence? If we inject current, we will be able to get some voltage. Throughout the domain, voltage will be measured, but this is a non-invasive technique, so we will only measure at the surface. So two probe is used for current injection and two probe used for the voltage. Now in case of X-ray tomography, you saw that X-ray source are rotated in a particular direction so that you can get a lot of data. So in case of planar radiography, we got only one set of data because only X-ray source was switched on for, for a particular position and the opposite side X-ray was detected and that, that was done. But in case of X-ray tomography, X-ray source was in, injecting the X-ray or applying the X-ray, but source was rotating so that it can look the object from the different direction. Same thing will be done here. So whenever we will have some circular domain, we will, in, we will we want to inject some current and we want to perform the tomography. That means we have to rotate the current source. But virtually current source is not rotated like X-ray source, just only electrode switching is made. So first of all, electrode will be chosen for current injection. All other electrode voltage will be measured and that voltage data will be sent to the computer and computer will have one reconstruction algorithm. This is nothing but computer program and it can solve the data and it can give, give, it can give the circular domain as the image of the object. So how it is coming? Because whenever there is the homogeneous medium, current flux will have some symmetry. But if we have some object having some higher resistance or lower resistance, current flux will be changing depending on the property of the material shown by yellow circle. Now, if we have the distortion in the current flux, the voltage dis distribution will be changed. And if the voltage distribution changes, automatically boundary voltage will be changed. Why the boundary voltage will be changed? Because the boundary is the last part of the domain. If the domain voltage changes, so the voltage at the last part will also be influenced and that will be also collected by the data by the voltage electrode shown by this blue rectangles. Now, in case of X-ray tomography, X-ray source is rotated. In case of current tomography, the current source is rotated. So it is similar technique, but only it is using the X-ray and it is using the current or electrical voltage. So it was invented by Professor John G. Hoekstra and R.P. Henderson in 1978. And since then it is used for biomedical field due to its lot of advantages. And nowadays it has several potential to be applied in different fields. So it is non-invasive, radiation free means it is not using X-ray, low cost, portable, only one laptop and 16 electrodes or 32 electrodes. Bedside measurement is possible. So many more applications. It can be used to utilize for medical imaging. Sometimes it will be useful for, useful for chemical engineering or chemistry so that we can visualize the reaction inside the opaque vessel. It can be useful for visualizing the cell growth in biotechnology. It can be useful for detecting the mines underground. It can be useful for detecting the cracks and voids in the civil engineering, which are using the, uh, say, a lot of concrete structure. Sometimes the geotechnical engineers are also using the technology to understand what is there inside the ground, underground. So we can visualize some water or minerals utilizing the technology. So these are the techniques of injecting current and voltage. Uh, may I know how much time I can get now? Sir? Hello. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Anybody can hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, so yes, how much? Okay, so I will continue. So these are the these, this is the procedure by which we can get uh, the idea about that how the voltage data are collected. So two electrodes will be selected for current injection, and other electrode pairs will be used for voltage measurement. And that voltage may, will be measured will be stored in a matrix form. There will be several data acquisition system so that we can collect the data, and the electrodes will be switched by multiplexers. We can see that voltmeters is rotating but it is not rotated uh, in real case uh, only the probes are switched from one electrode to the other electrodes after that the current injection electrodes will be shifted 
and then the voltage data will be measured. So we will get several voltage matrix and it will be stored in a computer in the form of matrix, rectangular matrix. Here it is, you can see that. So whenever we will have the data from the real system, it can be compared with the simulated data from the computer and you can get the image with the help of reconstruction algorithm. The instrument can be developed with the help of electronic component like ICs and register capacitors and several circuits are there. So first of all, we need to inject the current. So if we want to inject the current, we need to have some signal generator. And for developing the signal generator or current generator, definitely we need some electronic components and the electronic circuit bench. So we can start from the breadboard or we can develop our circuit on the PCB also as it is shown here. So with the hand soldering or machine soldering, you can solder many ICs on the PCB and we can use or utilize it for developing some circuits. It will be looking like just like motherboard or even smaller than that. So the instrumentation, I will come to the EIT instrumentation. That EIT instrumentation will have some signal generator, then current generator means it will be changing the voltage signal to the current signal. It will be switching through the electro switching module that is multiplexers. And then the voltage data will be collected by data measurement system or data acquisition system. So these are the circuit blocks. So VCO will generate the signal. It will send to the VCS, VCCS. VCCS is the voltage control current source. It will send to the signal to the MUX and MUX will send to a particular electrode pair so that it can be injected through a particular electrode pair. And after that voltage will be measured. The measured voltage will be passing to the amplifier blocks, filter blocks, and then it will go to, to the computer. So these are the how the schematic, how the signal can be generated. Say when we just later, if we want to vary the signals, then we can get several types of circuits using max 03 IC also signal can be generated. And if we want to convert that signal, we need to use the voltage control current source. So these are the schematic, how the current can be varied from one circuit to the other circuit. But if for getting the different amplitude of current, these are the signal conditioner blocks and the power supplies how the power supplies are developed. So these are the basic studies of the circuits, starting from the inverting amplifier and non-inverting amplifier we can develop. Here you can see that one non-inverting amplifier is shown. And with the help of the voltage identification means how much voltage is the use for the biasing voltage, you can limit or you can get an idea of the, the maximum amplification voltage at the output. Otherwise, there will be some problem of clipping, whatever is shown here. And this is the schematic of the multi-stage RPS or regulator. Okay, so switching, electrode switching will be explained. Here we can see that uh, the multiplexers can be developed with the DIP switch also. These are the manual switch, but that can be useful for the manual switching. And the con connections can be understood by this, so all the starting point will be connected together and it will be going to the electrode one, like that we will connect all the electrode one to 16, and then two will be connected to current source, another two will be connected to the voltmeter. So this is the instrumentation with the manual multiplexers. And these are the signals, whatever is measured, and the PCVS instrumentation. And these are the multiplexers for 16 electrodes. The multiplexer board. And this is the battery based instrument which is developed at the uh, doctoral research in IIC. These are the signals. So we can see that the electrodes which are fixed, those are current electrodes and other electrodes which are rotating, those are the voltage electrodes. So after collecting the data, we will see that the voltage data are shown in here. And that data will be taken to the computer. We will see that how data acquisition is done.
So then the saving option has come. We can save the data. So this is the reconstruction process. This, the schematic of the reconstruction domain is discretized by FEM and we will get similar type of image with the help of reconstruction algorithm. You can see that this is the saline solution, this is the plastic, and you can see that one object is there which has higher resistivity. Antum can be made with some tissues, some inorganic material also can be taken, and it can be developed with single steel electrodes, and the detection system can be controlled by the LabVIEW-based graphical user interface. We can use any other software also. So this is the graphical user interface front panel, and these are the data acquired by the PC. So these are the phantoms. EIT sensors, similar to the electrodes which are used for ECG. And the electrode numbers and the materials. These are the electrodes developed by several researchers, compound electrodes and applications. It can be applied for pulmonary imaging, neonatal imaging, breast imaging, and also brain imaging, cell culture imaging. Sometimes it is used for industry for imaging the slurry. And also it is suitable for detecting the the decay in trees, you can see that there is some decay in the tissue and you can get that type of images from the outside. These are the commercial instrument available in the world. So, I will skip some slides. So this is Pulbo Vista 500, which is developed by the Dragger Medical Germany. And this is used for pulmonary imaging. And this works on the principle of electrical impedance imaging technology. So the instrument which is called Pulbo Vista 500 is used for pulmonary imaging and it can uh, gives a lot of information about our respiratory system and it will be useful for detecting many pulmonary diseases. So as a uh, conclusion, we can tell that EIT is uh, very, very useful for physiological monitoring with the help of IoT technology. There are a lot of uh, advantages 
for transferring data from one part to the other part and wearable eit which is uh, possible to develop also that has a lot of potential nowadays people are working so a number of research opportunities are there to explore the nature and behavior of wearable instruments and especially for the eit based medical imaging device for the imaging systems with the other modalities making the wearable uh, say imaging device is very difficult so i thank uh, my research collaborators and my colleagues with whom i am working and i i am getting knowledge day by day so i am also thankful to the nit durgapur for giving me the opportunity to continue my research i would like to thank uh, professor tiwari uh, professor choudhury and professor gosal uh, i thank uh, head of the department of dr uh, bcrc electrical engineering department i thank vice principal sir and principal sir for vc ro engineering college and i thank all the faculty member of the vc ro engineering college associated with this webinar i also thank all the participants of rabsi 2022 thank you sir it was thank really you very a, much it was really an enriching uh, session for all of us especially the students of ei uh, instrumentation department the department of electrical engineering and uh, department of electronics and communication we are really thankful to our speaker for devoting such a um, uh, his, he has devoted his time precious time with us and really our students have increased a lot Uh, but now before we uh, conclude the session one we like to have uh, if is there is there any question from the students students you may go for it this is a platform for open question answer session with your speaker uh, yes sir i have a question yeah please uh, sir how this uh, technology will not affect the implants in our body uh, it is using electrical currents to get the image yeah so it is using electrical current but that current amplitude is 1 milliampere or even less and that will have very little effect on the other conductors and also we know if we are using some electricity in a circuit and in, if in the circuit board there are some other boxes containing some resistors or even the resistors are there nearby the circuit but it, if it is not connected and there will be very minimum effect or kind of interference because whenever circuit is not closed or if any element is not included in the circuit it will not conduct electrical current for the alternating nature of current there may be some interference but that will be very less in the low frequency and in case of the eit it is going up to for say 50 kilohertz or even for several 100 kilohertz only it is not going in the megahertz range so definitely there will be the less interference according to the maxwell's uh, theory so for biological uh, diagnosis that is electrical impedance tomography which is used for bio biology if some body implants are there that will be considered as the open circuit elements because they are not connected to the eit system also it is not connected to the other body parts only it is say piece of uh, iron bar so if you are doing the experimentation with electrical circuit and if one electric bar or say stainless steel spoon is there suppose you are you are eating some breakfast and you keep the spoon at the side of the Uh, electrical circuit but if it is not touching to any point of the electrical circuit or if it is not creating any closed path so definitely spoon will not interfere it will not be taking any current from the circuit so that's why if body implants are there but still due to several reasons one is the less uh, frequency less amplitude and the the most important uh, principle is that it is not included in the eit circuit that's why it will not create any problem yes sir thank you so much sir yeah thank you thank you sir uh, can we have next question is there any other students want to ask any question any doubt any students okay uh, thank you sir thank you it was really thank a you. wonderful thank session. you very much ma'am thank you Uh, but on behalf of my uh, department that's a the token uh, so will you just stop sharing so that i can yeah 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 share my yeah okay so uh, this is a small uh, token yeah thank us. you thank you very much uh, sincere gratitude uh, to our professor dr tushar kanti vera assistant professor department of electrical engineering nit durgapur is an appreciation of of the enriching deliberation 
of the one day seminar on recent advances in biomedical sensing and imaging it is uh, the session is organized by department of electrical engineering bc ro engineer this is a small token sir uh, from department of electrical engineering and our principal sir on behalf of the college i really thank you sir for thank joining. you i am also pleased and honored to accept it thank you very much thank you thank you sir for joining us thank you uh, thank you sir now i thank uh, you sir thank you thank you very much so i can uh, log out now yes sir Thank you. Okay. Thank you for thank joining. You, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks all. Thank and thank also, uh, I am just uh, uh, telling to the all the participants if they have any further query, mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, contact me. So my contacts is all already shown in the slides, and they can those things those information can be taken from the coordinators. So I have uh, I have given already my contacts. So if any participants are interested, later on also they can contact me for discussing about this uh, topic. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, sir. We will share your all your contacts to the students. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a small announcement for rest of the participants. We have session two with Dr. Devangshu De. He is associate professor in Department of Electrical Engineering, Jadavpur University. He will be having his next session on biomedical instrumentation. I'll request all the students to again join us at two ten. I'll request all the students to. Join us at two ten today, so you can have your lunch and join us again. And please follow the WhatsApp link so that you get the e certificate. Thank you. Attendance is mandatory. We'll again join back at two ten. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Shomitra sir, we will be joining back again at two ten. So we're logging it off. Shomitra sir,
very good afternoon students thank you for joining the session 2 today we are going to have the session 2 from 2:30 onwards uh, today's webinar uh, is on recent advances in biomedical sensing and imaging so this is a webinar that is organized on behalf of department of electrical engineering dr bc rao engineering college students you are well aware with the first session i hope the first session was very enriching for you all. The second session we have with us, the speaker, we have Professor Dr. Devangshu De. He is from Jadapur University, he is Associate Professor Jadapur University. Uh, he will be, he is there with us. So students, uh, he will be logging with us within a couple of minutes and I'll please stay tuned with the platform. We will be here to welcome him, our HOD, Dr. Shushanto Dotto will be welcoming him and will be, you all will be very much benefited from the lecture session of Dr. Devang Shudhi. Student, please, please stay connected. The students, there are a few announcements uh, regarding this webinar. You will be uh, receiving the webinar uh, certificate, one day webinar certificate on behalf of Department of Electrical Engineering within a couple of days. That is within this week only, but for that you have to join the session as well as student, you need to fill up the feedback form. The feedback form link will be shared to you at the end of session. So it's very important that you have the attendance as well as you have to fill up the feedback form. And that feedback form need to be filled up by today so that the processing of the certificate could be done from tomorrow onwards. Good afternoon all. Uh, good afternoon to all the dignitaries present here. I am Sneha Sisu Ghoshal, Assistant Professor Electrical Engineering of Dr. Engineering College. Welcome again to the Wednesday webinar on the in Biomedical Sciences. We are fortunate enough to have Dr. Debang Chude, Associate Professor of Jadavu University with us. At the end of sorry, the interrupt. sorry to interrupt, we are having a live session, YouTube live. I'll request uh, Dr. Shushanta Tattu, HOD Electrical, as well as our host, Professor Sneha Shishkushal, kindly switch on the camera. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to have Dr. 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 Dr.
at the end of the session will be conducted through this form which will be provided as a chat box at the end of the session. Now without wasting any time, I request our HOD sir, Dr. Shushanto Dotto, to give a welcome speech for this session. Over to you, sir. So, sir, already joined? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon to all present this webinar. Now we will go to start the second session. Expected speaker, Professor Devang Sude, FSF Professor, Department of Electrical Engineering at Jadapur University, colleagues and my dear students. Today we will have gathered once again a webinar about very important topic, recent advance in biomedical sensing and imaging. I'm highly honored to take this opportunity on behalf of the Electric Engineering Department to welcome all of you. Professor Devang Shude are highly qualified and possess vast knowledge and experience in the field of biomedical instrumentation. So now, the you know our students, the in our Macau curriculum, there are the two biomedical course already there. One third semester that is biomedical engineering and eight semester biomedical instrumentation is there. So biomedical related subject, this is not, uh, this is now uh, the very important. So please you listen carefully. And now I'm sure that we will, we will feel rich with knowledge after completion of this webinar. I welcome you all once again to the webinar and hope that you will have a great time ahead. Thank you all. Now, may I please request to Dr. Kamalika to introduce the speaker to the audience. Thank you. First, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor De. Thank you, sir, for joining us. It's joining a great us. platform where the students can interact with you. Even we, the faculty members, will be highly benefited from your lecture, sir. It is needless to be said, sir. We are very vulnerable in his research. But, sir, I'll still try to put down in few words. It's very, really, very, uh, you have a lot of experience, but I'll try to put down. Uh, students, we have with us Doc, Professor Dr. Devang Shudde. The, well, Professor Dr. Devang Shudde, sir, he received his Bachelor of Electrical Engineering and Mechanical Engineering, uh, sorry, uh, Master's in Electrical Engineering and PhD degrees from Jadapur University, Kolkata in the year 2003. Five and 2009 respectively. Sir is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Jadapur University, Kolkata. Professor Day has published more than 100 research papers in the international journals and conference in the field of his research, which includes 24 papers in IEEE transactions and he, is, he has also co-authored two books from Springer, Warlag, London, and Elsevier. And he has also edited two volumes that is published by IEEE. He is the principal investigator of three government-funded projects. Four patents have been granted to him, of which one is a US patent. He is a recipient of IEI Young Engineers Award in the year 2014. Air Research Association from SARF, Government of India in 2018, Vishweshwarya Young Faculty Research Fellowship in the year 2019, Outstanding Chapter Engineer Award by IEEE PES Kolkata, and two Best Paper Awards. He was the visiting research, visiting faculty member, and research collaborated in various institutes like University or Applied Sciences. Augsburg, Germany, and ISI Kolkata. His name is included in the list of updated science-wide authored database of standardized, standardized citation indicators, which is published by Stanford University and elsewhere. That indicates the top two percentile rank of researchers worldwide for the single year of 2020. Thank you, sir. Sir, and his interest, is his interest of interest are application of signal and image conditioning and processing tools in electrical and biomedical system 
conditioning, monitoring of electrical equipments, non-invasive testing that is related to condition assessment. Professor Day was in charge of measurement and instrumentation laboratory, Jadavpur University. He is the former secretary of IEEE Kolkata section and currently the vice chair of IEEE Signal Processing Society Kolkata and immediate past chair of IEEE PES Kolkata. Thank you, sir, for joining us. And I, my students will and we, the faculty members, will also get benefited from your lecture. Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us, sir. So it's now your platform. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction and uh, for uh, inviting me in this particular program to have an interaction with all of you. I hope that um, this particular program, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, in the first half also you have already uh, heard uh, some uh, interesting uh, lecture from uh, Professor uh, Tushar Kanti Bira. And now uh, in this particular second half, uh, I'll be uh, discussing something related to condition monitoring of biomedical systems and allied signal processing and machine learning tools, how they, uh, as a combination, can serve the purpose. But before that, I must thank uh, the organizers, mainly uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering of Dr. P.C. Roy, uh, Roy Engineering College. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, the or uh, the uh, the faculty members who are present here also uh, i can see some of the name of the probably the students are also there uh, so uh, my lecture uh, yes, it the is uh, are there. yes uh, my lecture it is a sort of a sort of uh, an interaction uh, based uh, lecture uh, if you have any question you can ask at the end of the uh, lecture also you can interrupt me in between and in any case uh, just uh, before uh, starting of this lecture i have got something uh, related to my internet connection if at any point of time you feel that the connection is not proper you cannot hear my voice please uh, just let me know by uh, either by sending me a message or making me a call i hope that won't happen uh, but okay if it is there please let me know so uh, with this, uh, let me share my screen. And please tell me whether it is visible, the screen. Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir. And now the slides are moving. It is the second slide. Is it moving? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. So. This is my uh, topic, today's topic, that is synergism of signal processing and machine learning tools for biomedical condition monitoring applications. And uh, many of the parts, before I start, I should uh, tell you that uh, many of the parts I have just deliberately, I have uh, keep them uh, uh, in this particular slides. Uh, maybe those things are quite known to many of the faculty members and researchers in this particular field, uh, but uh, for a continuation and for easy understanding of the others who are not very conversant with all these uh, techniques and all these uh, biomedical applications. Uh, for them, I have just kept uh, those things in the slides. Maybe they are very easy to understand and maybe very trivial for the uh, researchers in this particular field or the faculty members who actually uh, teach these subjects. So with this, uh, this particular topic, condition monitoring, if we look into it, what is this one? From the name, uh, it is quite easy to understand. That means to monitor something, the condition, to monitor the condition of something. Here, our domain is biomedical. So if a biomedical system is there, we are trying to monitor the condition of that. And there can be, you can understand, there can be uh, several of such uh, things, several of such these biomedical systems. So all of those systems we cannot discuss. We, are, we will be trying to find out the basic essence of this one and uh, I'll just uh, give you some example and case studies of uh, the research 
uh, that uh, that I have performed with my own research group. Uh, but they, I, I'll try to place all those methods in a generic way so that you can also use them in your own problem. But for this particular topic, I'll be discussing for some specific problems. Uh, otherwise, uh, there, there are so many uh, applications, so many applications could be there. Uh, we cannot uh, cover all those in uh, this particular, in one particular talk. So uh, if condition monitoring, if we look into this in, uh, say, the functional blocks, it can be divided into two functional blocks mainly. Number one is the data acquisition. That means if you are trying to uh, uh, find out the condition of any system, any biomedical system or any electrical system or whatever, uh, you have to acquire some data about that system. So data acquisition is an important part. But for today's lecture, I will be more uh, giving focus to the next one. That is after acquisition of the data, what no no <laughs> because with uh, this online uh, thing and online lectures so many things happen okay uh, nothing to worry about so here if we uh, just um, uh, we are going to uh, give focus on the analysis but it means if we get the data then what to do next with that and again the data can be one dimensional like a signal like a ecg signal and also it can be an image say an mri image or x-ray uh, plate image so either uh, it can be one dimensional signal or it can be a two dimensional signal and nowadays there can be multi dimensional signal also but for today's uh, lecture i'll prefer to restrict my discussion with the images but again i am telling uh, the these ideas they can also be applicable for one dimensional and multi dimensional systems or signals now, analysis and decision support, that uh, is the main topic of discussion today regarding the condition monitoring. And again, if we look into the functional blocks of this analysis and decision support, in many cases, or we can say in most of the cases, we can also divide it into two parts. One, we call it a feature extraction. And the second one, we call it a classification. And usually, the feature extraction we uh, usually apply the signal processing tools. And for classification, we apply some machine learning tools. So there is a clear demarcation of these two uh, algorithms. For example, signal processing algorithms, we can apply for feature extraction and the machine learning algorithm uh, for the classification. But what my topic today is that to uh, give the idea that nowadays, with changing scenario of research with the advent of the uh, classification techniques and uh, uh, the machine learning tools, those signal processing and uh, the uh, particular uh, classification to machine learning tools, they can be amalgamated. They, they can have a good uh, synergism and they can be mixed together to form one particular tool to solve the problem. The, uh, the problem is, say, some condition monitoring uh, problem. So let us discuss in details. Uh, but uh, again, I am telling that most of the initial portions, they are quite known. But for the continuation of this image-based, because I have uh, told that I am taking this uh, image as our signal, two-dimensional signal. So that is why I am just giving some basic idea for those who are not very conversant with the image and image processing. But uh, it can be, uh, I can uh, move uh, quickly uh, through these slides. So digital image can be classified in color, either a grayscale or binary images. And uh, the color images, you can have the three uh, different 
layers are there r g and b red green and blue with the combination of these three colors you can produce any color and any color image for grayscale image there will be uh, say a uh, different shades of uh, colors mainly between black and white and uh, say for if and they can be indicated in different numbers but i'll just show it later on but difference between grayscale and binary is that in binary there will be only black and white but in grayscale there will be black and white and in between black and white there can be several shades of this black and white and if we look into say an uh, mri or ct scan image of any part of human body uh, and uh, if we look into the grayscale version of it we can have this kind of a pixels so if we take a small part of a grayscale image and it can have different shades you can see in this diagram and those different shades uh, usually we call them and each pixel and each pixel has it its own shade and that shade value to the computer or in the digital image if we store it in a computer or anywhere any storage device it will be stored in the form of a matrix and those different colors can be indicated by different values for example say the black color can be indicated as 0 and the white color can be indicated as 255 uh, there can be other uh, representation also but these are the most easiest and most common representation of the colors and in between different shades in between black and white they can be indicated any number in between 0 and 255 for today's lecture if we remember the say black color is 0 and white color is 255 that will be sufficient for our discussion and any other color in between for a grayscale that can be intermediate and again an image if we look into this kind of a say uh, ct scan image it can be represented in a three dimensional image or three dimensional uh, say representation also for example this is a two dimensional image on the left side and the different values of the uh, pixels that can be indicated by these three dimensional heights or landscapes the height of the landscapes indicates the the value of the uh, grayscale uh, intensity and if the height is more means height is more means the value is more if it is say white those white portions are having higher peaks and the black portion that is a flat in this way we can also look into an image so different representations are uh, well suited for different application that's why i am telling but again these things are very basic things they may be known to you but, but I have just placed them in my uh, presentation uh, because I have heard that may, so many students may attend this. But for the faculty members and all those researchers, these are very redundant information, very trivial information. And usually we apply image processing for biomedical applications uh, for so many uh, purposes. For example, image segmentation, different portions of, say, a CT scan or MRI can be segregated. The all other portions may be not of our interest. So only important portions can be uh, segregated. So left hand image uh, is converted into a segmented image with different colors indicating different regions of the brain. And also image enhancement, pattern recognition, reduction of data. There are so many applications of the image processing tools. For example, anyone can tell us that uh, who is this person? Whose cartoon is this one? Anyone? Who is this person? Sir, Shahrukh Khan. Shahrukh Khan, yes. And the next one, Virat Kohli. Virat Kohli. Good. And this one, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. So the point I am trying to make here that these images they are not 
uh, I can say a photograph. Photograph has so many details of an uh, image of a particular person, but uh, this kind of an uh, image or this kind of uh, a cartoon or hand drawn images, they don't have that much of information, but still we can identify the person. It actually indicates that all the information that is represented in an image are mostly not required for us to get the required uh, information from that, to fetch the required information from the data. So there are super, uh, there are superfluous information. That means there are more information than we require. So that is why if we can eliminate those uh, unnecessary information and we can reduce the volume of the uh, image or reduce the size of the image, then that will be very easy for us for further computation. So reduction of data is an important aspect. And also image synthesis, data compression, data compression and reduction, they are quite similar, but a very fine difference is that the, uh, the, we can reduce the size that with the data compression and we can again return back but reduction of data we usually it can be uh, say uh, just done in su such a way that we are not interested to get back to the original image we can have the further processing with the reduced amount of information so sort of feature extraction we can see so this kind of uh, image processing tools or signal processing tools can be applied on biomedical images using these techniques, contrast stretching, histogrammicalization, convolution, smoothing, sharpening, noise removal, edge detection, and there are different frequency domain representation. Fourier transform may be known to many students. Wavelet transform may or may not be. And there are also uh, different image segmentation and other algorithms. But uh, let me tell you some basic idea, then we can move on how we can uh, add, uh, say, machine learning tools with this one to get a complete uh, feature, complete condition monitoring information. For, say, contrast stretching, I told you that different uh, intensity values, different shades, different colors can be indicated in uh, using numbers. So here, contrast enhancement uh, for contrast enhancement we can change those values for example here say the last third image that means if the value is between 0 to a make them 0 if it is between a to something make them uh, say a higher value like that we can change and here different contrast stretching we can have different images maybe we loss in some information but at the same time, maybe all of the information is not required, only the required information, they are enhanced or they are uh, made more properly visible. Uh, in this the idea can be clear from this image. The left image, if we can uh, adjust the contrast, we can have, that means if we can change the different grayscale values, uh, say with some proper logic, then we can have a more clear picture to visualize. We can also see the left one is has a hazy look and the right one is quite clear. So we can do this kind of a processing using some signal processing tools, like say some image processing algorithm. But we can also do the same thing by a complete system, which is having this kind of a signal processing tool along with the feature uh, the uh, feature classification or we can say any machine learning tool so that we can have a complete condition monitoring setup the histogram equalization uh, those who are even very naive uh, photographer very uh, beginner they also have this histograms uh, in in their camera that means it is a distribution of different values of the gray scales in or the pixels values or intensity values distribution of that if we can equalize then uh, the clarity of the image becomes better 
and this particular thing convolution i'd like to give uh, devote more time to this because it has a important role in our further uh, discussion so convolution is a mathematical operation this equation is a mathematical representation of the convolution operation but let us understand that physically because physical understanding will be more easier for us to know what is happening and say this is one function g and this is usually we call a convolution kernel say this is a, this one is a simple kernel of a say sort of a brick wall uh, some part is constant having some constant value and there the other portions are zero and if we perform the convolution that means this mathematical integration what physically is done say this is the function at the left and if we <clears throat> if we just move this if we just move this particular window or this particular convolution kernel over this just we can translate this uh, window over the function and we can just multiply it point by point and then add them up so if we just move it what does it mean say it is multiplied this function is multiplied say this value is say one by sigma or say some constant k take that as one if sigma is one this will be one so what does it mean physically if we move the function over it so therefore it is actually multiplying this uh, one value with all other values of the function so multiplying with one with all other values means and we are integrating mean, means we are summing them up so basically we are actually taking the addition of this and if we divide it by those sample numbers we are getting the average value so average value is actually giving us some sort of uh, low pass filtering that means if we apply this kind of a convolution the card will get smoothened because high frequency means those sharp changes undulations in a function if we take average what will happen all those low frequency portions will be there the overall shape of the waveform will be indicated so if we perform the convolution with this kind of a kernel that means a constant sort of a kernel what will happen the waveform will be smoothened so here you can see if we <clears throat> apply this one with a uh, say narrow window it is something like this and wider window more smooth curve we can get here we can do this in images also using the two dimensional kernel usually you say a gaussian kernel if we use Card gaussian we kernel looks like this here so here it is if we store a Gaussian kernel in a, 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 a computer, kernel, if you use the matrix kernel. representation, it will be like this. So here so it is. If we zero store a Gaussian kernel, low values, or you can say black, and the matrix representation, white, it will be like this. Here is 255 zero store a Gaussian kernel, low values, or you can say black, and the matrix representation, white, it will be like this. Here is 255 zero store a Gaussian kernel, and this matrix will be like this.
make you understand what is uh, how it is happening say if you if we uh, make this kind of a kernel if we make this kind of a kernel that in this kernel is placed over the image image pixel values will be multiplied now what will happen if all the pixel values are multiplied by this one and then divided by 1 by 9 what will happen so all the pixel values will be multiplied by 1 then added up then multi uh, then it will be 1 by 9 uh, actually that means we are actually averaging those values averaging the local pixel values so in this way Averaging means it is actually a low pass filtering. So it will be giving the smooth value of some uh, image. The same thing we can do for the signal also, one dimensional signal. If a signal is having some random noise, some undulations, if we take some average, so because of the, if it is a zero mean random noise, then if we take the average, the mean will be zero. So therefore the undulations will get diminished so this is the basic idea of using such kernels similarly here we can have if the image if we can have this kind of a random noise if we just uh, use the averaging then the representation of the image will be much more clearer this is a left hand side the noisy image and this is a simple smoothened version of the image and this is we, we can have this kind of a say zittery noise or this kind of a hazy uh, pixelations are not visible in the right side image because but we can uh, you can understand that 100 percent elimination of noise is uh, is not possible most of the cases so uh, the amount of denoising if you are satisfied with we can go for it so what my objective is to uh, establish here is that that means if we can choose different kind of uh, kernels that means different kind of small matrices and we can apply the convolution operation on image different results we can find for example if this kind of an uh, kernel is used here you can see the all other are minus one and the uh, central is nine so all the pixel value will be multiplied by minus one and the central one is multiplied by nine. So if all the pixel values are same, then what will happen? So that means all the pixel values are black. So it will be multiplied by one minus one. There will be eight ones, eight minus ones, and then you have to multiply plus nine. So therefore it will be one. So here, if we apply this, so this kind of an effect, you can have it is a sharp image that means the edges the color changes they are much more vivid here the same thing you can do with a it is called a high pass filtering and here in place of nine you can have eight so what happens here is it is minus eight and plus eight if all the colors are same then it will give us the zero value so here here you can see this is the uh, left side image and the right side image is like this more of uh, in most cases where the color are same see here it is sort of a gray value so gray value in the right side they are mostly black why black because black color is zero here i have made this central value is eight and others minus one so if the pixel values are same the result will be zero so that means if we pass on this kernel, the regions where pixel values are same, they will be indicated here in the uh, black color. Only those where the uh, pixel value changes, only those portions will be having some higher values. That means those portions will be indicated in white color. So the change in pixel value, that will be indicated here much more clearly. So this is the idea, this is the physical idea of creating kernels. They can be used for edge detection and you can have this kind of an image and the edges, edges means where the pixel color value changes abruptly. So here, 
the lines they actually indicate different ages some ages are important some ages are not so important because in the black region there are certain because of noise there are certain ages certain change in color so those ages are not required for us so we can have the ages also and can anyone tell me what is this the physical meaning of this one that means it is actually the zero crossing of laplacian laplacian you can think of like a second derivative it is a little bit different from that simple second derivative but forget the uh, for the time being we can uh, assume that as a, a second order uh, second derivative we can say of a function and zero crossing of the laplacian means the second derivative is zero so what does it physically mean that means say here in the left side initially the color is black please follow the cursor initially the color is black then again it is having say white color then after some white it is becoming black again so if we take the derivative so derivative that is the rate of change and if the rate of change increases then dy dx will be positive and if the rate of change uh, say uh, i mean uh, if it is changing abruptly then rate of change will be high and dy dx is uh, zero at maxima or minima now double derivative is zero that actually gives the point of inflection that means sort of a the uh, there will be a change from positive dy dx to negative in between we can have a zero so that is sort of a point of inflection so here you can see those lines are there that means it indicates zero crossing of laplacian indicates that from black it has become white then white to again black so this kind of a repeated change in the gradient is occurring okay these things are not uh, required to understand uh, for the particular lecture but if we can think in this way then the physical understanding will be much more clearer so there are different types of kernels we can design and different kinds of result we can uh, extract so here uh, one kernel is called a sobel kernel uh, the structure is more or less similar to the hypers filter only different values are given uh, to enhance the edges so you can see different age different portions are uh, much more clear in the right side image so these are the signal processing tools we can use i am just giving uh, this particular convolution operation uh, for uh, for a certain purpose that i can explain later on in my later slides so again this is the uh, image and again we can perform the fourier transform like the signal uh, i am not going into the details of the formulation but physical understanding is more important here so if this kind of an image is there it is periodically black and white the colors are repeating so that repetition indicates the a uh, frequency otherwise there is no physical meaning of uh, frequency in case of images so it is the frequency of the gray image or the intensity values if they are repeating that means from zero it has become higher value 255 then 255 to again zero again 255 so they are repeating that means if we uh, indicate them as a, a signal then some repetition we can understand and if we also plot this kind of an image in terms of our three dimensional representation that i have also indicated higher value means three dimensional landscape it is a higher peak and low zero value means it is lower peak so you can have this kind of an oscillatory function so if we perform that mathematical equation that is given here we can have this kind of a representation in four quadrants there it is symmetric so black spot this white spot indicate actually the frequency here if it is uh, the frequency is varying in this direction we can have this kind of a spot if the frequency is varying in the vertical direction and high frequency the spots are further away so the basic idea of this representation is that from center 
that is say low frequency that means zero frequency and if we move towards right it will be x axis frequency if we move to move towards uh, vertical direction bottom or up it it will be the uh, y axis frequency and closer to the origin i mean this particular center it is the low frequency higher it will be the high frequency here in this diagram you can see the horizontal direction the horizontal direction black and white gaps are less that means more frequently the uh, grayscale values that is changing more frequently the grayscale values are changing so this particular uh, frequency along the x axis dots this these two dots are further away compared to the vertical dots why because you can see the vertical dots vertical dots they are repeated they are repeated in a slightly uh, larger distance away that means their frequency is less than the horizontal one so that is the two spots they are actually close to the origin so in this way we can represent that means if this particular image is much more complicated like this one this is having so many pixel values distributed so many differently so it will be not such only two spots there will be several such spots several such frequencies are there so different images can have different frequencies a, a different representation so left hand side is the image and the right hand side is the two dimensional fourier transform of this image and we can do so many interesting things uh with this because we know that if we have the fourier transform we can have an inverse transform we can get back the image also so here if this particular image is there and we have the fourier transform then we can if we modify this uh this uh, fourier transform coefficients and we made all the further away uh, coefficient as zero see black means zero so zero and if we then perform the inverse transform what is the difference the bottom image is a smoothened version of this or a blurred version of the top image why blurred that means we have kept only the central region of the coefficient and central region or uh, the, the region close to the origin that is actually low frequency region so basically we are having the low frequency component so different the same result we can have with different ways i told you about the averaging smoothing kernel etc that can have the same image after using the smoothing kernel we can also have this kind of a low pass filtering also we can do the same thing in frequency domain so one is we can do this in spatial domain also we can do the frequency domain uh, filtering so the same result we can have different ways maybe different things will be useful for different problem that's why so many things we uh, if we know all those things that will be easier please see the next one here we have done the other way round here we have done the other way round that means we have just uh made the central region zero and the outer region uh, outer region all those coefficient we have kept them okay so we have kept them the outer uh, higher frequency values so if we just uh, construct reconstruct the image we can have only the fine edges there because high frequency component they actually uh, indicate the fine uh, edges or the finer details of the image so what is the image is all about we may not have the idea only the finer changes in the shape in different locations that will be indicated so it actually uh, it actually gives us the very basic idea that low frequency actually indicates the overall shape and high frequency gives the uh, finer details of the image that can be uh, also uh, understood from this image it is mainly i have just put them for the students so whose image is this anyone whose image is this einstein einstein albert einstein albert einstein but let us make that like this a little bit smaller now it has it is very difficult to identify but can you identify the image 
at least you can say it is not Albert Einstein. So when we blow it up, we have the finite details. So the finite details mean high frequency component and the low frequency component is something else. It is some other image. Actually, it is the image of two persons. One is Einstein, other is Marilyn Monroe, and they are uh, just uh, mixed in a way that Marilyn Monroe image is having the, uh, it is passed to the low pass filtering and it is the high pass filtering. So finite details of Einstein's image is stored and the low frequency component of this <coughs> Marilyn Monroe's image that is stored. And when this image is formed, if we look the finite detail, that is a larger view of this, we uh, it looks like the image of Einstein. If we shrink it, the low frequency, shrink it means if the image becomes more small, then what happens? Our brain averages the nature. So if, if take the average means the low frequency component of the image, so that means it will look like the image of the Monroe. Here, a better representation. It is an elephant, it is a cheetah. So here, the low frequency component of elephant and high frequency component of cheetah that is mixed. So the right side image, it is the image here, probably you can see it is more like the image of more like the image of a cheetah, isn't it? Now, if I make it smaller, what happens is that you will find that surprisingly, it looks like an elephant. For example, if you're looking at an elephant from far away, like that. So here, this is the beauty of it. Mainly, it is very common and known thing. I have just placed it for the uh, for understanding of the students. Okay. So in this way, we can also do some filtering. Say there is a, some noise in this particular AZ image. If we remove, if we can identify in the frequency domain, these are the two, uh, say, coefficient values responsible for noise. If we can make them zero or make them black means it is we are eliminating them. If we reconstruct that image, the image becomes much more clearer. So in this way, we can use the signal processing tools. Now the case study, I'll just take, there can be so many case studies. I'll just uh, take the skin abnormality. And there can be different kinds of skin diseases are there. Only a few I'm just uh, going to talk here. Say here, these are the images. These images are called dermoscopic images. That means a very close, clear image of a skin. There are special uh, instruments for that. But uh, let us consider that as a simple camera. And the camera is taking picture of the image, uh, skin and taking images of the skin for different diseases. We know there can be a uh, different pigmentation of the skin and skin cancer can also be there. Not only skin cancer, there can be other not so harmful diseases also like psoriasis, tinea, and there are so many diseases on skin. So basic application of this is to identify the skin disease. We can say that, okay, uh, doctors are quite expert. They study all these things for four or five years, even more. Uh, then, uh, and after uh, practicing over the years, the expertise goes. So, if we are, uh, uh, if you are planning to do that using a signal processing tool and a machine learning tool, uh, is, will it be possible at all? Is it a, a good way to uh, do the thing? The answer is, if we can. Or oh, decode the knowledge the doctor uses for any analysis. And if we can code it in a, a proper programming, then we can have the same, almost same result. This is particularly important because you know, in our country, population is so much. Uh, in per 1,000 people, or uh, per 1,800 people, there is only one doctor available. So this is the case. So if the doctor 
some system can assist the doctors then the time required for a doctor to attending one patient that can be reduced so therefore a doctor can attend much more number of patients similarly here the expert doctor have to see those images carefully and maybe in some cases uh, he or she has some doubt also even uh, being an expert so in that case if we can have some assistance with this kind of a machine learning tool that can be of helpful no machine learning tool is 100% accurate so there must be some human judgment but still if we can provide some solution that can be easier for the doctors to make the final decision so that is the basic objective of uh, discussing all this priasis and pinia they actually look like similar and but their treatment is different so if we can uh, just uh, using some machine learning tool along with some signal processing tool if we can solve the problem that will be a good thing for the patients so here that is the basic idea basic scheme it is very simple scheme uh, say we have taken the dermoscopic images some pre processing tools are there then we can have some segmentation then some feature extraction some important feature we can extract then we can have the classification so this kind of a structure can be fitted for any this kind of condition monitoring problem it can be biomedical it can be a machine fault also in case of a machine fault this dermoscopic images will be replaced by your machine fault data so machine fault data that denoising can be a pre processing stage then segment segmentation may not be important for that part segmentation can be eliminated but then feature extraction we can have directly so you can have different features from that particular signal and then classification so this particular way of doing things we call this kind of feature extraction is called the handcrafted features so that means if we have a feature extraction algorithm and from that algorithm which feature to extract using which equation if we know that is called a handcrafted features so if we have handcrafted features then we can have a classifier there can be uh, support vector machine svm or any neural network based, based classifiers uh, i am assuming that at least uh, most of the uh, uh, students and faculty members in the audience they know uh, classification feature extraction these tools etc because i cannot uh, cover up all those within this one hour so that is why i am just assuming that these things are known but my idea of telling this is that if we can have the idea or knowledge to which feature to extract then handcrafted features are good but in many cases it is not possible that means which features are uh, to be extracted we may not have the idea so in that case this kind of synergism is very helpful so let us discuss that with the example say in this case in the image you can see there are hairs body hairs are in the image if we can remove them that will be easier so pre processing stage we can use them as a separate signal processing tool for the removal of these things so in the next image you can uh, see the the particular hairs are removed how they are removed there are there can be morphological operations i am not going into details because of time constraint say there are some erosion and dilation operations erosion means one particular image portion the edges will be eroded like this and dilation means the edges will become thicker here this is an example of dilation that means this particular image has smaller portion smaller regions like this so if we perform the dilation operation on this the right side image that means you can see all the these boxes these lines they have made much more thick so this kind of a thing we can have using dilation and even for erosion operation what happens is that the same image if we perform the erosion the lines become thinner 
So if we perform the erosion operation twice, you can see in the right side, the fine lines, those lines, they are not at all visible. So in this kind of a mathematical operation, we can remove the thinner portions like the hair in that image. So in, it is not that simple also, but I am trying to give you some idea. So that kind of erosion operation using some sort of kernel also, we can have the uh, result like that. So different kind of morphological operations are there. There are different names. One thing you can have the idea like that, say erosion and dilation. Erosion makes the uh, thing thinner, dilation makes the thing thicker. So here, if we perform on the same image, one erosion and one dilation, then what happens? This delta indicates dilation, epsilon indicates erosion. And if we subtract them, plus minus means we subtract them, then what will happen? We can get a boundary. So in this way, we can also have the boundary. So this simple mathematical operation on image, we can do nice things. So here you can see this kind of a three kind, uh, three images are there. We can have grayscale value of the image and you can find out the edges of this by applying this kind of and the border irregularity and different parameters of the border that actually gives the idea of the uh, to the doctor that whether what is this particular skin disease whether it is a cancer or it is any other disease that can have the idea so this kind of a mathematical or we can say signal processing application we can have for decision making I am just skipping a bit faster. So in this way, we can segregate an image. We can uh, classify its different regions and we can find out whether it is a skin cancer or not. So these are the, in this particular image, these small dots in the particular patch of the skin, sometimes it is called dot if they are small. If they are much more thicker, it is called the globules. So these dots and globules, their positioning, their density, number of dots and globules, these are the logic behind the decision making uh, done by a doctor. So if we can apply the image processing tool and if we can make the doctor's logic coded in a program, then the program can also detect as in a similar way, the doctor detects the uh, state of the disease. We can have the fractal analysis also. Okay, uh, the younger students who are not uh, familiar with the fractals, uh, don't bother about that. It is some sort of feature extraction tool, we can say. The irregularity and other things we can have. So this kind of a features we can take and we call it handcrafted features, that means rectangularity, elongation, aspect ratio, solidity, eccentricity, average distance, distance variance. Okay, this kind of a thing we can apply on uh, as a features. So these are the handcrafted features from the expertise we know them. So if we know which feature to take, then it is easy for us to extract the features and then classify. Here we have applied like this, say this is one image and we have different color spaces like RGB, HSI and others. That means one particular image can have different color representations and we can have different types of kernels are there and different types of kernels if we just make them correlate uh, cross correlation or we can have the convolution operation, then we can find out what is the result and from that those features this kind of uh, features we can extract from the images and we can classify them using a classifier and we can identify uh, the four classes here i have just it is one of our paper uh, that is why it is a four classes there can be any other disease for on skin if it is not skin then you have to change the class it can be melanoma, nevus, BCC, or SK. These are the names of different skin diseases, okay? 
so melanoma nevus bcc or sk that can be determined by a computer program and we have tested it on a large data set but more challenging cases are there where the system is much more complex here the same thing we have done using a super pixel based uh, classification super pixel means the regions having the same kind of a uh, color information or same kind of a texture they can be taken as a uh, same region so in this way we can have this so till now i have just told <clears throat> you one particular way of doing things that means you can have the image you can apply a separate known signal processing tools for denoising some segmentation etc then known features handcrafted features can be extracted then using a classifier we can do that like this the scheme is shown here but the problem is becomes challenging when it is not known the cases are very critical that means there are different cases they are quite similar to each other and difficult to uh, diagnose there can be different cases like a b c d e f there are different diseases say one melanoma a and b c and d that is nevus d and e that is some sort of keratosis and uh, with and the marking they are done by the experts the doctors they actually gives this kind of marking on the image and the, on the basis of the nature of these markings they actually decide whether this is the what is the disease in many cases it happens like that there are two different diseases but the nature it appears almost similar to the doctor so these are the some challenging cases and in those cases we do not know what kind of feature we can extract so that is why this i am just uh, telling this last one this is quite known to you many of you that is uh, called the convolution neural network or uh, it is one type of uh, variant of deep learning network it is sort of a black box sort of thing so if we give some input after training it will give some output okay it is a uh, advanced form of an artificial neural network and the, those deep learning networks are uh, quite uh, used for so many applications nowadays and you can see uh, if, if in image processing there are 100 research papers more than uh, 60 to 70 percent they are nowadays on this kind of uh, convolution neural networks so convolution neural networks means here uh, this is well known diagram of handwriting recognition in our case it uh, this should be not handwriting a disease image so here it actually uh, performs some convolution operation on the images layer wise and after that with the final result it gives uh, it, it actually gives us the output the beauty of this why i am showing this is that these are the features it is learning that means if you just uh, perform the convolution operation with some of iteration after iteration the convolution kernels will modify itself like this that means for handwriting you can see please follow the cursor you can see different strokes different uh, variation of say turning and other things it is actually learning and you can see this kind of a complex feature it is difficult to indicate them as a handcrafted tool or a handcrafted equation so that is why in many cases much more complex features are to be learned that we cannot represent in terms of equations so in that case we can apply this kind of a uh, convolution neural network or deep learning network the initial layers actually extract the features and the final uh, layers they actually classify them you can see here the convolution layers up to this say please follow the cursor up to this say so one two three four up, up to this say it is learning then actually in the fully this fc layer is fully connected layer like an ordinary 
neural network it actually classifies so those who knows uh, those who know this particular convolution neural network fine those who actually did not know anything about this particular uh, convolution neural network just remember convolution neural networks are networks which actually performs both the task one feature extraction then classification so both of them are actually done by the same network there is no such separate algorithm is required for feature extraction separate algorithm is not required for the classification so that is why it is quite helpful where we are not sure about the uh, which feature we have to extract we have just applied this one uh, this uh, kind of a network and we have applied it uh, we, we, we do not extract any feature and we uh, do you know that network actually learned the feature and then also classifies it and he got uh, very uh, good results for that and one beauty of this one of this particular work is that usually the neural networks and others when we say your network is going to do the feature extraction as well as classification then what is happening inside there is no such idea for the researcher there's what is happening inside the network is learning something and it is giving you the results there are ways to understand what is happening that means what what is learned by the uh, particular network so that that's what we have done in our one of the recent works that we have learned what is uh, just indicated by those kernel that means the kernels what are they learning and we have just indicated them what we call it a relevance map that means in this image which portions they are actually giving in more importance in decision making and this particular uh, yellow and red regions they are actually indicating the important regions and here you can see different methods are giving different uh, importance on different regions and red means more uh, most important regions and gradually decreasing color means the importance is also gradually decreasing so in this way the network is actually learning which portion they have to give importance and this particular thing is actually goes with the knowledge of the doctors because we have checked them with the doctors on the basis of that we have selected the patches the regions of the patches and all those patches are actually the doctors are looking that means in this particular say image some portion is darker some portion is not so dark and those pigmentation and other color changes are good indicators of the disease so also we can see the our network is not actually acting as a black box it actually showing what it is learning it is actually learning this kind of patches in that particular images that is why it is giving good results but it can be other run because uh, maybe you have seen nowadays in facebook or something some videos have become viral that an automated camera movement system is actually uh, say uh, thinking the moon as a say football or a, or, or a li round light as a football on the playground so this kind of mistake can be done by a Uh, this kind of machine learning tool so you have to choose the tool and you have to verify them judiciously so that uh, less and less error should occur no tool using machine learning and other things can be 100% uh, accurate we can say uh, that can be uh, very difficult to uh, say that it will be 100% accurate so that is why uh, we have to be careful for biomedical system that it should not make any Uh, drastically or very dangerous or fatal uh, error in decision making so that is why we should be careful about using those tools there but the idea i am just giving trying to emphasize is that here in this kind of a network signal processing and machine learning tool they are fused together you cannot segregate them that which part is signal processing which part is the machine learning we cannot segregate usually we can do it in case of feature extraction and then classification but here it is quite 
uh, synergism of this thing. And for complex cases, they this kind of synergism gives us good results. So these are some the references from that I have prepared the talk for blowing my own trumpet. I am just uh, showing some of the results, some of the papers that we have published on the basis of that we have uh, I have prepared this presentation. And actually nowadays our students actually uh, they actually do the hard work and we take the uh, full credit of their work. So I should thank my co-worker as well as uh, my uh, researchers, students for doing the good research works. And thank you again. If you have any question now, you can ask me. Sneasis. Sneasis, please continue with the question and answer session. I hope I'm on time. I'm just yes, looking into the watch so that I can finish yeah, it on sir. time. Thank you, sir. So it was uh, such a nice uh, session that uh, we didn't look at the watch at all. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sneasis, please just continue the question and answer session. Yes. So, student, anybody have any query? If anybody have any, any issue regarding the microphone or something, you can put your query on the chat box. Or you can ask sir directly. If anybody have any question. Okay, I understand that. Okay, uh, I have just uh, just told so many things in this small span of time. If, if you have any question, my contact numbers, emails are there with the organizers. If you have any question later on, you can also ask them uh, or you can also mail me. So not an issue regarding that. Okay, okay. so now as a i just request uh, professor uh, shunil kumar choudhury to uh, showing sir, uh, sir our uh, appreciation a small token of appreciation from our end hello sir uh, good afternoon sir uh, it was an immense pleasure that we had you uh, in our session kindly Kindly accept the token of appreciation from our end, sir. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you so much. It's very nice. Thank you very much, thank sir. You. Thank you. May I request uh, Sir uh, to end the session before the thanks? Good evening to all. Uh, to my uh, good evening to my distinguished guests, my speakers, participants, uh, the students, and all my uh, faculty and staff members of Dr. B. C. Roy Engineering College. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for the one-day webinar on uh, recent advanced event in biomedical sensing and imaging. I like to thank. Uh, wholeheartedly the speakers, the distinguished speakers, Professor Dr. Tushar Kanti Veda sir and Professor Dr. Devanshu sir uh, for making for this session uh, truly in a uh, truly enriching session sir. Thank you sir for your, it's really an honor for us that you joined us and uh, to this platform. So it was uh, such an interactive session sir. Thanks, thanks a lot from behalf of Dr. B. C. Roy Engineering College. 
I would like to express a whole lot of thanks to Mr. Shomitra Goswami and Mr. Shovik Chandra, the PR department, who gave us the wholehearted support, the complete technical support they gave us, the infrastructural support they provided us to conduct this webinar on a large scale. To let let me uh, share with you this, we had more than 330 participants who registered for this um, uh, webinar. It was really, uh, we, the students were so much excited on the topic, the session, uh, that we have uh, such a grand participation. Because of restriction of 100, 100 participants in the Google Meet, we had a continuous live telecast in the Facebook Live. And even there, we have more than 100 participants, 100 students who joined us and made this uh, session a truly a wonderful one. Thank you, Shomitra uh, Goswami, and thank you, Sovik, sir, for, making, uh, for giving us the complete support. I also like to thank our HOD sir, Dr. Shushanto Dotto, and all the faculty and staff members of Department of Electrical Engineering who supported us on this um, uh, on this webinar. And because of their participation, wholehearted participation, they made the event truly successful. Finally, I like to thank Professor Sunil Chaudhary and Professor Sneashis Ghoshal to organize the session on a such a wonderful way. Uh, finally, the wonderful students who turned up this session in such a grim numbers. They joined us. They could interact with the speakers. And uh, the, uh, we are really thankful for wholehearted cooperation from your end. Once again, I'd like to thank to all the BCR organization as well as uh, the speakers, the participation participants. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm leaving. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you sir. very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.